All right. So this lecture will kind of wrap up the basic ideas we want to talk about about images and lenses. And we're going to explore a little bit more of this in the last lab. So. Um, since a lot of this also depends on kind of exact drawings, because you're drawing things with angles and things that can be very particular, uh, I gave you most of my notes already in completed form, with some of the examples blank that we'll talk through and then work through. So you shouldn't have to do much writing, just listening, except for the examples that are uh, not done on the blank version provided to you. So let me recap uh, for geometric optics that we've done so far using that, the fact that light travels in a straight line through mediums or vacuums, and that it reflects off or transmits through boundaries. We talked about last time that we can define this property called the index of refraction, which defines the light speed through that medium as the speed of light divided by the index of refraction. N is one for a vacuum and very, very close to one for air, so light travels at exactly C in those mediums, or lack of medium, and then if you have something like water, water has an index of refraction of about 1.33, so then it travels through water at a slower speed. And if you have, you know, I think diamond has some like, like you know, it's a greater than two, example, uh, for, <coughs> for example. So someone was asking in class, does that mean you can travel faster than the speed of light? You know, if light travels slower in water, and you happen to have a way of going really fast through water, can you travel faster than the speed of light? You can actually, uh, and we have done this, or we have seen part. Well, we have, we have not made humans travel faster than light, but we have seen particles travel at superluminal speeds. Um, these, there are these little particles called neutrinos. They're even smaller than electrons. The sun's emi is emitting, you know, gads of them every second. Lots of them are flowing through your body, you know, as I speak because they don't interact with, with matter very very easily. They do ever so slightly, but it's a very, very rare occurrence. Um, and so they built these big underwater, uh, essentially just, um, just big vats of purified water. And they would just wait, because they knew that they had calculated that, uh, you know, if the neutrinos were to uh, hit one of those water molecules, which they knew was gonna happen very rarely, but when it did happen, it would, the energy released from that collision would cause particles within that vat of water to move at superluminal speeds. They'd be moving faster through that water than the speed of light. And just like how when you have a plane that moves faster than the speed of sound, you get a sonic boom. When you move faster than the speed of light in water, they got a blast of radiation, which is called uh, Schrenkopf radiation. So, pretty cool. Uh, it actually helped us understand what was going on in the interior of the sun and it also developed a, it upgraded, helped us upgrade our model of particle physics to now we, there are different kinds of neutrinos that have, quote, different colors and different properties. Okay, so last time we looked at reflection, where if you have a mirror or, you know, some smooth reflective surface, a light beam that comes in will reflect off that surface, and we define the angles based on the normal of the plane that it's reflecting off of. So again, this is a non-ambiguous way of writing down something that defines the plane. And then so we measure angles from that normal vector. So this angle then defines the incoming angle, or the incident angle, then this angle defines the reflected angle. And for mirrors, um, it is, they are equal. Now that might smell like a conservation property or something like that. Indeed, there is some sort of optimization that's going on. Uh, you'll learn about Fermat's principle um, when you get to upper level mechanics. And they're actually, nature is making a choice as to what path the light can take. Um, and it chooses to do it in, in order to minimize uh, time, the amount of time it takes to get from point A to point B. So then when you have something like a rough surface where the law of reflection is still being obeyed, um, but in this case, uh, you know, each different light ray might be taking a different reflective path, which then can, um, you know, when you have something super, super smooth like this, you can get things like polarization, or something like this uh, ends up just being kind of a little bit of a mess. Then we have refraction, where there's a bending of light across an interface, and refraction does not depend on the wavelength. It's just saying that, you know, light comes in and it bends. 
And the way that that was uh, quanti quantified was through Snell's law, where they're, you're changing mediums, like you might be going from air into plastic. And so in that case, uh, you have two different indices of refraction. And so the incoming angle when you're in medium one uh, is related to the outgoing angle when you're in medium two through Snell's law. So then I have this kind of simple example where I have a block of plastic that has an index of refraction of 1.5, and then I have a light beam that's going to come in from the outside air, which I'll take the index of refraction to be 1. So in this case, the light beam comes in, and I measure that it has an incoming angle measured relative to the normal of 61 degrees. I then can plug in, and I know I'm going into plastic that has an index of 1.5. So then I can calculate what is the angle that it should, you know, at this interface, it comes in at 61 and it should exit at whatever this angle is here. Well, I can figure that out through Snell's law. So here I have it down here uh, that you know, I plug in one, then sine of 61 degrees equals 1.5 times some un so the sine of some unknown angle. So then I can solve for this angle I move the end plastic over here, and then I would take the inverse sine of both sides. So that seems that the angle that it exits here is the inverse sine of this ratio times the sine of uh, 61 degrees. And I get 35.7. So then it comes in at 61, it exits at 35.7, then it travels to the other side of the interface, and by symmetry, then that means this angle is 35.7. And so then it exits again at 61. So it ends up ultimately going in the same direction it came, but there's this overall translation that occurred. And we looked at a couple other mirrors in class of, some type of where the mir mirrors, like well, I did one lecture where, again, it, it reflected back, but it was translated a little bit. Then we did one in class where it reflected back, but um, it came back in the same direction it came. So, again, refraction is when it does not depend on wavelength. Let me just quickly bring up the, the other way that things can happen, like which is dispersion. Which dispersion is when this the angle that the particular beam of light bends by uh, is wavelength dependent. So if I shoot in white light, which is compromised of all the colors, that different colors would bend through that interface by certain by different amounts depending on their wavelength. So the index of refraction in that case is a function of wavelength. Or again, red waves are red has longer wavelengths compared to blue violets that have shorter wavelengths. And if we go beyond the electromagnetic spectrum, from long to short, it's something like radio, microwave, infrared, visible, and then it goes to ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray. So dispersion, the most common examples we know, um, that you know of, are prisms and raindrops. So if you have a prism, um, I could have, you know, white light come in here. So white light then, once it hits the interface, the different colors bend by different amounts. So the red end up going this way, then yellow, then green, then purple, all ended up bending by different amounts. And then when they hit the interface again, they each then bent back out into the air, again, though by different amounts. And so therefore, white light comes in, and you get a rainbow that comes out. Now, we could ask ourselves, well, we know that air has an index of refraction of about one, and that this prism, which is probably glass or plastic, is gonna have some index of refraction greater than one, but it's gonna also depend on the wavelength. So I specifically drew red on top and purple on the bottom. So does that mean the index of refraction for red is greater than equal to or less than, I mix those, I swapped those, uh, is, is red less than equal to or greater than the index of refraction of purple? So that's our question. And then it'd be nice if we could also be a little more, if we could describe these paths, perhaps using Snell's law. So the way we can do this, I did this. So I adjusted the beam, the white light beam. So I adjusted my, you know, my flashlight or whatever I was shining to the prism. I adjusted it so that the red light, once it bent and refracted during this first interface, it was traveling in a straight line across the prism. That's not a requirement. I just did that so that it's a little bit easier to visualize and distinguish between the two. 
So in this case, and let me zoom in, it wrote these kind of small. So I have red that comes in, red comes in, and of course it hits an interface. And so this interface I can draw, and then I can define a normal vector, or a normal line in this case, that gives me you know, the angle that it came in. And then if it has, you know, for some index or refraction corresponding to red, then there is some angle that com it comes out at. Now, if you look at this, and we look at, go back up to this example here. Here I went from a small number to a larger number when I went through here. And notice what that effect had. And these are good things to remember. Um, when you go from a lower index to a higher index, the beam of light bends toward the normal. So notice that I went, this is a 61 and this was only 36 or around there. So the angle decreased. I was closer to the normal line before, you know, after versus before. So when going from low to high, I bend towards the normal. And then when I go from high to, high to low, in this case I went from 1.5 to 1, notice that that had the effect that I bent away from the normal as a result. Oh, and I guess I forgot to talk about this part here, such that, you know, when you're interior, uh, when you're going from low to high, I'm sorry, uh, when you're going from high to low, there is, it's possible I could get total internal reflection as well. So that was also part of the review. So let's use that down here. So when I go from low to high or from air to prism, I am bending towards the normal. And notice that this angle, I drew this angle to be bigger than this angle. So I'm bending towards the normal. And then when I go from high, high to low, I bend away from the normal. So once I get to this interface here, I can define a normal vector, and I bend away from the normal in that case. And so by the by symmetry, since I said that this was just a horizontal line, uh, then it exits at the same angle it came in at. Now let's look at purple. Here I just copied what I what I drew, so we can see at least qualitatively what this is implying. So it seems like it's coming in at the same angle as red, right? They all, all came in as white light, so they all came in at the same angle. And then that defines the interface it hits, it defines the normal, and then it bends in this direction. Now the way I drew it, it looks like it's bent almost exactly along the normal. A little bit of an exaggeration, but that then tells me the index of refraction must be larger for purple than it is for red. Because the larger the change, the more you bend towards the normal. So in this case, the index of refraction for purple must be larger than red. And then again, I come in here, I eventually hit this interface at a different angle. So there's some in, you know, incident angle. And then I'm going from really high index of refraction to low index of refraction. So I'm really going to bend away from the normal. So. Here, bend towards the normal, then here, bent away from the normal. The normal vector is being that and that. And so we can also try to estimate this quantitatively, where you can, again, at this interface here, I can apply Snell's law, though the index of refraction I use will be different for red compared to the index of refraction I use for purple. Though they both will, have, will, will use one for both in air, and they both have the same incoming angle, since it was just all white light that came in. And then you could estimate, and then if I measured the angles you know, in an experiment or in a lab, I could then estimate the values of n, for example. And again, it's not as extreme as what I drew. For a glass prism, it's usually something like n for red is about 1.52, compared to like n purple for 162. But if there wasn't a difference, you would not get a rainbow on the other side of the prism. The same thing for raindrops. So raindrops, actually, the physics of a, the physics of a rainbow through a raindrop is actually um, pretty interesting. Um, we could do an entire lecture on it if we wanted to. It involves both reflection and refraction. So the so let's talk. So here I drew some examples of um, making a rainbow around sunset. So. If it's you know it's recently rained or there's a lot of water vapor in the air um, and it's sunset, I drew some raindrops, these big blue blobs, 
and sunlight coming in more or less along the horizontal compared to the ground. Again, that's why I said sunset, sunset or sunrise. So in that case, then the sunlight, sun, the sunlight rays come in parallel to the ground. Um, when you do that, so I drew two specific raindrops. Of course, there's lots of more rain in the atmosphere, but eventually as sunlight is going through, sunlight will hit and travel through uh, a raindrop. And I drew two specific examples. Of course, sunlight, there's more than just two beams of sunlight. But it turns out that there is some interesting kind of geometry that goes on that everyone sees the rainbow at the same angle in the sky. So if you, have to, if you and your friend are both looking, are both kind of across the field from one another, you both see the rainbow at the same angle. And you're just seeing two different, you're each seeing some combination of light rays that have uh, hit raindrops and then reach your eye. Because again, you don't see, the, if you see a rainbow, that means light is coming from that rainbow to your eye. So the primary ra rainbow, or if you only see one rainbow, you're seeing the primary rainbow, sunlight is coming in and then there are then what happens is it refracts total internally reflects and then refracts back out and they're a little different for red versus purple right and then of course you can imagine smearing all the colors between red and purple i'm just going to draw red and purple so this upper raindrop the purple you know does that and then the red kind of comes down here where another raindrop slightly below it, another beam of light hits it, does the same thing inside the raindrop, and then the red kind of goes down here, and then the purple comes down here. So ultimately, you get kind of the reds over here and the purples over here. And of course, then there are more raindrops, and that kind of just shows you the examples of kind of where the two limits are. So as a result, there's a range of colors that ends up forming kind of in you know, that makes an angle kind of in this direction from the horizon. It ends up that you can calculate this and it's about 42 degrees. So whenever you see a rainbow, um, you know, whip out your protractor, I know you all have with you, and see if you can actually estimate the angle it, it is. If it's sunset or sunrise, right, because I drew these, you know, with the sunlight coming in at a specific, from a specific direction. And again, so that means if, you, if there was some other person, you know, if I were to even draw it, you know, some other person, they would have to look, they would not see the same rainbow you're seeing, but they would have to look, I drew them in the wrong direction, they would have to look kind of in, in that direction and there would be some raindrops that was intercepting some other beams of light and they would see a rainbow in the, you know, somewhere over here as well. If you see a double rainbow, that double rainbow, there's something very similar going on, but, um, oh, I guess something I should point out. And again, these colors, oops, that was supposed to be, these colors are specifically ordered, right? I figured out that the red goes here and the purple goes here. So you can also see, this also explains why red is always on top and purple is always on the bottom when you see a rainbow. But then if you see a double rainbow, it's switched. So then there's some other kind of combinations of ref reflection, refraction that happen. It's slightly different than what goes, for the, goes on for the primary rainbow. And then you get another set of, you know, another prism of colors, but red's on the bottom, purple's on the top, and it's at about 52 degrees. Um, and it's usually, um, it's, it's, it's much dimmer, uh, and it's, so you, it's dimmer, wider, and inverted. Uh, you know, the kind of primary rainbow is, is compact, red on top, purple on the bottom. The double rainbow, if you do see it, it will be above it, the colors will be flipped, and it'll be probably a lot dimmer. So, kind of cool. So the next time you see a rainbow or a double rainbow, right, you can always check the colors. The color orders will always be the same. And if it happens to be around sunset or sunrise, you can try to see if these angles make sense. And, yeah, I guess note, I said note, rainbows can only be seen facing away from the sun. Uh, if, the sun if sunlight is coming in from the left, that means the sun's way out over there. So, um, you always have to look away from the sun if you're going to hope to see a rainbow at all. That's not a safety, well, that is a safety warning, don't look at the sun. But that wasn't just as to be a safety warning, right? The physics says that the 
location in the sky to look for a rainbow is away from the sun. Okay. Now let's go on to images that are made by mirrors and then images that are made by uh, lenses. So the concept is pretty straightforward. Um, we just have to kind of recast it in a physics lens. Uh, so let's talk first about plane mirrors. Um, plane mirrors create images by reflection. So first basic concept, which I just said above. To see an object, that means that there has to be at least one light ray from that object reaching your eye. And usually we need many, 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 many light rays to reach our eye in order to have enough light for our eyes to uh, pick it up. So for example, if there's a daisy off in the distance, in order for me to see the yellow capitulum, or I think that's capitulum, well, whatever, um, that's in the center of the daisy, that means, in this case, really what's happening is light is coming in from the sun and reflecting off different parts of the daisy, and, and some of that light that reflects off the daisy eventually makes it to my eye, and therefore I see a daisy. So for example, when light reflects off this middle part of the, of the daisy, there's many, many more light rays that I'm drawing here, and they're all going off in, in all directions. Some of those make it to my eye, and so my brain and my eye then sees, since light came from this direction, there's a daisy located here. And again, not all the rays need to reach our eye. Uh, and the rays that we draw in this class really comprise many, many, many rays. Um, um, so now let's talk about the idea of mirrors, plain mirrors, reflecting. So when you look in a mirror, you see an image of objects around you, maybe even well as yourself. So you know that when you look in a mirror, you're located here, but you might see an image of yourself that looks like they're somehow inside the mirror. Um, and so, right, if you did not really have the mental wherewithal uh, to know that it was an image, you might get confused and think, well, why am I over, why, I'm here, why am I over there? Um, I think it's fish, right, they can, you know, you know, fish through reflections, you know, they, they get very confused by the reflections. And I feel like when my cat was a, was a kitten, uh, he looked at himself in the mirror once and got scared. But it also shows that, you know, the, even animals, right, have some ability to learn because my cat could care less when he walks by a mirror these days. So, how do you see yourself in the mirror, and why does the reflection look like it's, or the image that's created, which we know is reflection, but why does it look like the image is behind the mirror? So, and then if there's something behind you in the, in the mirror, it also looks like, like that object is farther away, and you'd have to reach farther into the mirror to get it. What's going on? Here's um, my drawing of some of that stuff. Um, where we have something like you're looking in a mirror and you the cyclops observer you're looking in the mirror and you see yourself kind of in a straight line uh, somewhere in the mirror looking back at you the image of you and then if your cyclops cat is hanging out very close to the mirror you see you might see an image of the cat and it seems like they are closer their image is closer to the to the surface of the mirror than you are so again, you're not looking at the actual object, but you're looking at an image of the object. And depth does appear to be maintained. Objects farther away from the mirror create images that are that appear farther back behind the mirror. So we can do this by using the law of reflection and just by um, thinking about um, the path that light rays must take. So here's an example. And this, I think, should be the first kind of instance where the blank version I gave you should look like this on the screen, and now we're going to figure it out. So suppose there's a Christmas tree, and I want to talk, and I want to just focus on, uh, and I have this giant wall, you know, this is a big mirror. Um, it doesn't even have to be a big wall mirror, I just drew it pretty big in this, in this drawing. And you can have some mirror that's on the wall, and I want to think about whether or not I can, you know, if I were to see the Christmas tree in the mirror, how do I see it? And um, can I understand that using the ray nature of light and the law of reflection? Now, one way to see the Christmas tree is, of course, to look directly at it. 
So what goes on? Uh, and let's just focus on the star, which I'm going to treat as a point particle. So in this case, the star, when it's lit up, yeah, maybe I should make it different. Give it some, give it some color. So it's some star that's lit up. Oof, it's terrible. It's too hard to see. So you have some star that's lit up, and it's emitting rays of light in all different directions. And here I draw just a few. Um, I'm gonna save that area actually. I draw just a few, um, you know, for as an example. Now, in order for us to see it, some of those rays of light have to eventually make it to our eye. So, of course, I could look directly at the tree. And in that case, let's do a straight line. And in that case, there is going to be a ray of light. Let me stick with it, the same color. There is going to be a ray of light that is heading towards our eyeball. So, in this case, this is an example of. If we just look directly at the tree, there are some rays of light that eventually re that are eventually traveling towards our eye. We see a star there. So this would just be kind of looking at look directly at the tree. Therefore, then you see the light from the object. And you then, your brain assumes, okay, there's a tree in that direction. Because that is where the light is coming from. Now I look in the mirror and I see another tree. My brain tells me, my, I know that I'm seeing an image, but what do I see and where do I see it? Well, in this case, I'm going to use three rays, you know, just to help illuminate this, pun accidental that I'm going to use three different rays that are very, very close to one another. So I'm going to have a ray that goes down. Um, uh, actually, where I position myself is going to matter. Um, I'm doing the calculation in my head real quick. It might be a little too high, but that's okay. So I'm going to use a beam of light that goes in that direction. And then I'm going to have another beam that's really, really close to it that might go here, and then another beam that's really, really close to it that might go here. And again, these are just three rays of light coming from the tree that just happen to be traveling, you know, essentially along three very, very similar paths. And then what happens? Well, if I zoom in here, what I get is the law of reflection is applied at each of the for each of these beams at the interface. So there's a little normal, a little normal a little normal vector, that then the law of reflection is obeyed. And then they bounce off and at the same angle they came in at, and then, actually I didn't draw too bad. They got pretty close. They all eventually come and eventually meet, meet your eye, or in your general vicinity. And notice how it, what they were on slightly different paths, so they diverged a little bit as they were traveling towards the mirror, and then they actually would continue to diverge as they after the reflection. So, in this case, we then have, these are the light rays that reflected off the mirror. And so, looking at the red, red beams and not, not the blue beam, if I see, if I have those rays coming from me and they seem to be diverging off the mirror, what your brain does is it extrapolates backward. If you have, you have light rays that appear to be diverging and are coming from this direction, uh, your brain will just kind of follow their paths backwards. So, what ends up happening so then if we try this, and I take a line, and your brain extrapolates back, it might have a beam of light that goes there, and then if I take this beam and I extrapolate back, and if I take this beam and I extrapolate back, 
you get something that oh it snap. Try to be try to be helpful and snap into place, but then ruined it. You get something that looks like that. And you would notice it's kind of hard to see with the dash line, that they would all converge at about here. So what happens? What does that mean? That means that since they all appear to converge here, that is the image where you see the star. You see the star at some point located, it seems, behind the mirror, where, because again, your eyes are seeing that light is emerging from that point, and all that light seems to be emerging from this location. Now, of course, there is no actual object there, so this is an image, particularly we call this a virtual image. So a virtual image, um, so there are real images and virtual images. So we call this a virtual image because that is where light appears to be emerging from, but there's no actual object there. So, so the image is located at the position where light appears to be emerging from. But there's no actual light that's being that's emerging there, which is what, is what makes it virtual versus real. So again, there's no actual energy that you know. If I if I go to the modern view of light, there are, I can't count any photons that are located at this position here. There's nothing actually behind the mirror. That image exists in a sense only in your brain. There is no actual star behind the mirror, but your brain has kind of tried to fill in the blanks because it sees a bunch of light coming from that location and then it extrapolates back to see where they, all that light uh, emerged from. And so therefore we see a tree with a star and then there'd be some sort of tree over here which appears to be behind the mirror. And then notice that this depth seems to be pretty similar then, turns out it's exactly the same as the distance of the tree from the mirror. Uh, let's see, uh, then to make sure these notes match, I had highlighted these, some of these things. Um, right, the real ray was kind of the blue one. Um, there you see the light directly from the object. And let's see, there's, there's, uh, there's these rays here I'd highlighted in green, just to imply that those are just your brain extrapolating backwards um, to get a virtual image. So that's the idea. Now we can be a little bit more quantitative about it. Because we could ask, okay, it seemed like the, the, the tree appeared behind the mirror, and it seemed like since the tree was somewhat far from the mirror, it appeared back in the, in the mirror, the image was somewhat far back from the mirror. Well, essentially what we did on this, other, on this thing here is what's called ray tracing. We used a couple example rays to um, measure kind of the location and direction that all these beams of light were traveling through and around. So, we can do this more carefully for a point particle. So I have some, uh, I have some object here, which we're gonna call the object. So, and it is some distance from a mirror, and I want to figure out kind of where I see it in, in the reflection, and then try to be a little bit more quantitative about things. So if the object is here, we can define it's distance from the mirror, again, based on the normal to the interface. So if this is just one big interface, then this distance here defines the distance to the object, which we use P. Because O looks too much like a zero. So we have some distance P. Now, and, and light rays seem to emerge in all directions, well, light rays do emerge in all directions uh, from this object. And so we want to think about the ones that reach our eye. So the ones that reach our eye, there's going to be one of those rays are, is going to come in, hit the mirror. By the law of reflection, we know what, that this angle and this angle are going to be the same. And this particular ray that I drew happens to eventually meet, meet my eye. 
But again, your brain just sees light come in from this direction. So your, your brain extrapolates back and assumes that the object must be somewhere along this line uh, because it saw light come in from that direction. And then what you can do is to see where the object appears in the mirror, uh, you can find another ray uh, that converges with that. Uh, so particularly here, I have, a, I have a ray that, you know, that if it travels in a straight line, it hits the normal. The image, if you were standing at the object, would see the image located here. And that's where these two intersect. So in this case, the image is located here. Because uh, again, then that beam will appear to be traveling in a straight line towards you. And it's not too hard to convince yourself that you can calculate that this distance here, which we call the image distance, is exactly the same as the distance the object was from the mirror. So uh, in this case we might quantify that and there's a convention that we say that the distances on kind of the real side of the mirror are positive and the distances on you know, the Narnia side of the mirror are negative, um, the things that exist behind the mirror. So in this case the way we would quantify this is just say that the location of the image is just negative the location of the uh, actual object for plane mirrors. And that's for a point. Now what if you have a, what if you had an extended object? Well if you had an extended object then you can just treat each part of it like a point. And there are rays of light coming off you know in most in all directions from each point on that object. And usually what you can do is you can just look at, say, the top of the, of the object and the bottom of the object, and then you can fill in the blanks. So I kind of do that example here, where we have some kind of just, usually we use just an arrow to quantify the orientation and size of the object. So I could also quantify and call this the original height or the height of the object. And so then if I look at the top of the object, and I think I do that using blue, right, there's the mirror image appears where they where these two beams intercept and again it's assuming my eye is kind of down here I'm gonna draw that put my eyeball here and then if i do that same thing for the bottom the bottom the image kind of bounces there but the Im or sorry the light bounces there and creates an image right here so then the image appears over here compared to the object so then I can quantify the height of the image and say that that is the height of the image. So in this case, it looks like the plane mirror does not distort the image at all. I see the image is still upright, right? This is an upright arrow and I get an upright arrow because again, the tip of the arrow then became, got, went there and the base of the arrow went there. So then when I fill all the parts in, in between, I seem like I get the same arrow. So there's no magnification. So for the plane mirror, Notice that the object's original height, sorry, the object's height equals the image's height. And so we can define what's called a magnification, which can mean whether, you know, it can also mean that it gets smaller too. We just use magnification to, to mean it distorts in some way. Um, as the image height divided by the object height. So in this case, it's just plus one. The plus does have some meaning, right? The plus just means that it's the same orientation. If it's a negative number, that means the image might appear upside down. And since it's one, it's the same size. If it was a half, that means it would be it would appear smaller. If it was three, it would, it would appear three times bigger than the original object. Here's another example. I believe I leave this all filled in for you, yes. So you might notice if you have like a plain mirror in your in your dorm room or in your bedroom that it's probably not nailed to the wall directly on the floor, right? There's usually some gap between the mirror and the floor. And you might have noticed that the mirror, when you look into the mirror, you can't see everything in reflection, right? You don't see the entire room in reflection, but there are only parts of the room that you see in reflection, you know, which is why you know, it's possible for you to not see yourself when you look in a mirror if you're looking at the mirror at some weird angle. So suppose you're standing in front of your mirror and you're trying and you want to quantify how far away from the mirror is the last thing you can see. 
Because if you have something immediately below the mirror, you might notice that you don't see it in the mirror. So there is some gap here of stuff you cannot see. And it's going to depend on your height, what this gap is, and how far away you are from the mirror. So here's what we're trying to quantify. We're trying to find the last possible location uh, on the ground that you can see in the mirror. And then also try to understand where these virtual images are located. So here's, here's the setup. We have the mirror here in purple, um, which the base of the mirror is a distance of 0.38 meters above the ground. Then you are 1.72 meters, and you're standing 2.2 meters away from the mirror. And we want to find what is this value of x? That is the last location on the floor you can actually see in the mirror. This actually isn't too bad. You just look for triangles. Now again, with if this location x is the last place we can see in the mirror, that means there is a there is a beam of light that hits the mirror and comes back and makes it to your eye. So I drew that beam here. This is the last beam that makes it to your eye. And if I were to move x, if I were to go a little bit farther in, it'd be impossible for me to draw any beam that goes and eventually hits my eyeball. Again, using the law of reflection. So, I have this, and then I have this, and then I have this distance here. So as you can see, there's lots of triangles that pop out. So here's the idea. So we have this triangle here, where the light ray comes in at some incident angle. And I know enough to actually calculate that angle. So I know that this horizontal height here, sorry, horizontal distance that is 2.2 meters. And then I know if this is 0.38 and this is 1.72, then I know that this must be 1.32. So then I have this triangle here. And so then it looks like I have a right triangle. I soak a toe on my way to an answer. So it looks like in this case I have to do toa. So the tan of that angle is opposite over adjacent. So I have 1.32 meters divided by 2.2 meters. The meters cancel as, as they must. I can then take the arc tangent of this thing and I get 31.35 degrees. Okay. I then know by the law of reflection that this outgoing angle is also 31.35 degrees and must match this as well. Um, but then I want to find something out about this triangle here. But that does still help us, of course, because um, right, we can do, what is it? it's like a I forget what the word is. And you have these two parallel rays, then you have this ray here. Complementary? No, no, uh, uh, whatever, whatever it's called. So then this angle here must match this angle here, etc. You also know, so it turns out then that this angle is also the ref, you know, this the same 31.35 degrees. And also I do know what this angle has to be as well. Because if I have, let me do a bit more. Because if I have this as a 90 degree, and I know this angle, 31, let's just say, then I know this must, this, these two angles must add up to 90 degrees. So you have something that ultimately looks like this. I have this, this angle, this triangle here, where this angle is 31.35, then this angle here has to be 90 degrees minus 31.35. Also, that means that this plus this plus this add up to 180. And then again, you're off and running. I have, I know that this is, uh, you know, that corresponds to this right here. So that's 0.38. I'm trying to find x, and now I have whichever angle I want to choose. I could use that to get. Well, um, well I guess I got to be careful. Um, I could find, I could use these and figure out the hypotenuse, and then use whichever angle I want, or I could use. Toa, uh, Sokotoa, the tangent again. The tangent of this angle, because I know the adjacent and, I know, and I'm solving for the opposite. So again, then I have the tan of this angle, you know, which I define this phi as 90 degrees minus um, 31.5. I could just calculate that number and plug it in directly. Um, of course, I like to plug in numbers at the absolute last possible minute, so I might also identify a trig identity where the tangent of this which is 90 minus that 90 minus theta is the same thing as one over tangent of theta. 
This is just a trick identity. And then Sokotoa says that tan, you know, since that the tan of this angle is opposite over adjacent, so then I have ultimately this entire thing is equal to opposite over adjacent, and then I just solve for x. And I get 0 0.624 meters. So any object located closer to the mirror, uh, I will not see. It's the claim. It might be nice if you could actually try to write that out or try to justify that using ray diagrams too. So for example, you know, suppose my cat is located exactly at that location. Well then what I see is that beam of light bounces and then comes here. So my brain extrapolates and I see the cat located 0.624 meters into the mirror. I see a virtual image of that cat where he appears to be inside the mirror. Then suppose I had a red cat toy that was located closer to the mirror uh, versus my cat. But you actually can draw, right, I can draw with, ray with a ray diagram, I can have a beam of light come from that red ball and hit the base of the mirror, kind of like the blue rays did. Um, but then by the law of reflection, and you kind of can see it here, right, this corresponds to the normal, ve the normal vector, and it kind of comes in, the law of reflection says that angle has to match this angle. So the one that hits the base of the mirror goes off in this direction. Doesn't mean it doesn't come close to hitting my eyeball. And it's pretty easy to convince yourself that every other beam, so there's some light ray coming from the red ball that hits, say, this location of the mirror. But again, since this angle must match that angle, it bounces off the mirror and goes even farther away from your eye. So none of those beams are gonna make it towards your eyeball which is why then we can't see anything in that region. Yeah, and this is just to go that there are many, many, many more rays actually coming from these objects. And usually what we do is we consider some extremum cases, like looking at you know, the ones at the base of the mirror or the top of the mirror, um, or we try to find some sort of representative, hopefully easy to calculate rays to use. Okay. Now let's do images that are created by lenses. And what we're going to really be thinking about is thin or ideal lenses. So a lens, you know, as you can see I'm wearing glasses right now. They are two thin lenses that are refracting light that comes in in such a way to help my eyes create more meaningful images. Telescopes, microscopes, you know, binoculars, all these things are using lenses. What we're going to consider are two kinds of lenses. There are lots of different kinds, but they usually fall into camps of either converging or diverging. In particular, we're going to look at the double, the double converging and double diverging uh, types of lenses. And consider this only in the context of uh, refraction. The lenses can have dispers dispersive effects. So a converging lens, or what's sometimes called a convex lens, uh, I'll use those two words synonymously. Um, and they're synonymous because converging lenses, their goal is to bring rays together, to converge them um, to a particular location called a focal point. And they usually end up having a convex shape. Uh, so I will use convex and converging kind of as synonyms. So particularly we're going to look at the case of a double convex lens. So you can get a double convex lens by overlapping two circles and then that kind of overlap part is the shape of a convex lens where it's kind of fat in the middle and gets thinner on the top and on the bottom. There are other kinds like a uh, convex plano lens or it knows it's kind of convex on one side and it's flat on another or one that kind of looks like a moon where I think it's called meniscus convex where it's kind of two moon shapes but they're at different curvatures. Again we're just going to focus on double convex. So, some terms, to get some terms out of the way. If I look at a convex lens, you know, where it's kind of fat in the middle, uh, thin on the top and the bottom, that defines an axis of symmetry here uh, that kind of goes through the middle of the lens. And so we'll call that the symmetry axis. And then it also defines a central axis, which is kind of the other axis of symmetry in a sense, uh, but is the vertical kind of. So it seems that there's this convex piece here and then a convex piece here, which is why we call it a double convex. Versus something like this where 
It's kind of a convex piece here and then a plain piece there. So what happens is if I have a bunch of light coming in on parallel paths, and the parallel paths is where is is an assumption we're going to make about the rays coming in. It turns out it's a very good approximation. So there you have some object off in the distance, and you have rays of light coming in on parallel paths. What a convex lens does is it converges them all to a particular point that is called the focal point. Now this focal point. Um, right, there are two focal points because you can th think of rays coming in and they all converge to a point here. But then by symmetry, you can imagine if rays came in the opposite direction, it would converge to another point here. So you have a focal point, which is where all the light rays converge to when you send parallel right, uh, light rays in. And it actually turns out by the, the, the construction of the shape that you can have parallel rays coming in at any direction. It doesn't have to be along the axis. So notice in this case they're all coming in at an angle, but nonetheless they still all end up converging to some location on what we call the focal plane. So again, if all of the if these two are all if these two are aligned on the central axis, but then light rays are sent in at an angle here where they're not here, they converge just somewhere on this plane, which we call the focal plane, and they have this particular focal point. Again, we're always going to consider kind of this case, um, but just to point out that these lenses do have this property no matter how the light comes in. This distance from the middle of the, of the lens to the focal point, we call the focal distance, just how we were talking about the image distance and the object distance. So again, it's measured from the center or from the central axis. And I think that's all we need. So particularly at, for at this focal point, right? If you have light rays coming in, and then they all converge to this point. If I were to keep drawing them, it's not that the light stops there, unless maybe you have some sort of film or some sort of a white piece of paper, uh, then they would just diverge. All right, since the light rays are collecting here, if we did have our eyeball there, we would see an image. And it seems like light kind of collects there, or if our eyeball was over here, it would seem like light is emerging from that point. Uh, so we call that a real image. So an image that is, and turns out real images form on the opposite side of the lens of the object. So the ob you know, the Christmas tree or whatever it was, was over here. And all those light rays converge to a point here. That would form a real image at that point. Um, that is where we would see the Christmas tree at this point through, you know, using the lens to kind of project the image somewhere else. And again, if this were a camera, Right, it'd be that light would come into your camera, then all the light would be converged to a point, which might be where the CCD or you know, the Polaroid film then captures that light in, the, in a real image forms. So real images will form on the opposite side of the lens, uh, and they actually, they're real in the sense that light is converging to that point, or light is, is diverging from that point. So right, you can actually capture the photons if you wanted to on a piece of film. As compared to virtual images, which we saw with mirrors, uh, virtual images turns out will form on the same side as the lens. Um, and again, there will be no actual, it will appear like light is emerging from those locations, but no actual object will be there. So this parallel light ray approximation is actually a very, so we're going to assume that objects that are sufficiently far away for, um, from you have be rays of light that come in at parallel angles, or sorry, at par or parallel directions. Angle would be zero. Parallel light rays actually is an excellent approximation when things are far away. Now, let me use an extreme case, or especially in astronomy, where when you look at sunlight, I can assume with great, with great accuracy that all the different rays of light are coming in at um, parallel rays from me. You know, and I just do a quick, two, quick example. It's a high school trick question. Uh, if you have a piece of the sun that's emitting light rays, and one of those light rays goes to the bottom of the Earth, one of those light rays goes to the top of the Earth, what is the angle that it's that it makes after the light rays travel the 93 million miles or so to get to the Earth? Well, you have a triangle. It's not a right triangle, but you have a triangle here where there's some angle theta, which we're trying to figure out. But I could turn it into two right triangles because I know that this base here is the diameter of the Earth. 
So I actually have two right triangles that each of these sides is the radius of the Earth, and then each of them make an angle theta over 2. And then this distance here is what we call an astronomical unit, uh, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 93 million miles. So then you can look up what those numbers represent, you can look up, you can look up the radius of the Earth, you can do all this and um, figure out the uh, angle that it makes, which turns out is about 5 times 10 to the negative 3 degrees. So very right. So that means this ray of light and this ray of light deviate from being parallel by only five times ten to the negative three degrees. Pretty small. And there's these other things called arc minutes and arc seconds, uh, which are even smaller angles. So you can take one degree and break it into sixty pieces. That's an arc minute. So it's about 0.29 arc minutes. Then you could take one of those arc minutes and break it into sixty pieces. We call that an arc second. So it's about 17 arc seconds, or 17 and a half arc seconds. And just to give you a sense of scale, one arc second is the angular size of an American dime held 2.2 miles away. So have your friend go 2.2 miles away, hold up a dime, measure the angle you see, that's an arc second. So that's just a quick aside of um, that this parallel parallel rate parallel rays approximation is a pretty good one, particularly in astronomy. So an obvious example of a converging lens would be a magnifying glass, um, which you might have used for nefarious reasons back in the day, where if you have rays of light coming in into your magnifying glass that and acts to converge um, those rays of light to a particular point, which hopefully there's no bug located there. Again, then energy is all concentrated to a point. The idea of magnification is that then you're you're thinking about rays going in the opposite direction. That this object has, you know, rays of light bouncing off of it that then get spread out to form a bigger image when you look at it through the other side of the magnifying glass. So, and here's one you have to fill in as well. So. The question usually is something like this. I have some object, which is case I have this little tree, that is some distance from the lens. And again, that is the object distance, which we again call P. I have a converging lens, uh, which is, has two well-defined focal points, there and there. One is kind of on the same side as the object, one is on the opposite side. So I'll call this, I think, the, I'll think when it's on the same side of the object, um, I think I call it the back side versus the front side. Because again, your eye is over here. You're trying to figure out. When you look at the object through this lens, where does the object appear? And then, is it magnified? Is it not? Is it inverted? What's going on? So again, there are many, many, many rays um, coming off of this object in all directions. Many of them are hitting the lens, many of them are not. But to simplify your life, there are three, three particular rays that are useful uh, to draw. And then you just see where they converge. And it turns out that you only need two, right? You need two to converge. And then as long as you're doing everything correctly, then the third one will also converge at that particular point. So I outline kind of three rays to use, uh, which I'll trace out with you now. So the first one is uh, the blue ray, so that's an object, so that, and I'm going to use the top of the object and draw from the top. So start at the top of the object and draw a straight line to the central axis of the lens, like that. And then again, this is a converging lens, and so ultimately what happens is it converges the thing down to the focal point. So that particular beam of light goes into the lens and comes out and aims towards the focal point. And I realized I didn't really go through that very well on the previous page. So let, let me pause this example, I apologize, and go back here. Right, what I ultimately said is light rays came in and made it to a focal point. Of course, what goes on is that it crosses the interface here and it crosses the interface here. So what really happens is this beam of light comes in. At that location, it's curved, but at that particular location, if you zoom in enough, right, there's the normal. The law of refraction is applied, and then once it hits this interface here, there's the normal. The law of refraction is applied, and then that beam of light goes here. This one here, 
it hits you know parallel to the normal so that there's no refraction and then it hits parallel to the normal there's no refraction and then similar sorts of things go on on this side too so I apologize that I skipped over that before so the way we're gonna we're gonna draw it just to be simple is you can essentially draw it, you get the same answer as if you draw it as a straight line to the central axis, and then have it just go down to the focal point. So that's one. The second one is one that goes, is the symmetric uh, ray, where if you go through the back focal point first, and then go to the central axis, something like that, then it emerges in a horizontal line. And it goes out like this. So the two focal lines. Right, if you go through a focal point before you hit the lens, it comes out a straight line. If you go, if you hit the lens, uh, you know, if you go as a straight line, um, really, I should be saying a line that is parallel to the uh, symmetric axis, then you come out towards the back focal point. And then third, looks like I chose it to be red is when you go directly through the center point of the lens something like that uh, you get no refraction at all essentially right at the top right you're hitting it and where the the lens has slightly started to to um, curve but it turns out then you're cur you're essentially hitting it along the normal at that location and then here you're essentially hitting it along the normal at that location so, and that's when you go through the central point, right? Not that, which is different than the central axis. You're going through the central point. So, that that makes your life a little bit easier. Essentially, you can always draw at least two of these things, and where they converge, that is where the image forms. So then, in this case, what happens? Let me copy this tree. Is what happens is you would get an image that forms. All right, there. So, if I were to fill this out, there's some distance here. We call this the image distance. So, what do you see? And again, your eye is kind of over here, looking through the lens. You would see an image that is a real image, but it is, seems to be shrunk and flipped. In this case, you see an image that is smaller than the actual object, and it appears upside down. Because again, I drew all these rays from the top of the tree. So where they all converge, that's the top of the tree. Then I could then imagine doing the same exercise for the bottom of the tree. But in that case, all three lines that you would draw are just along this, the horizontal dotted line. So they would all just converge to the same location on the other side. So. Yeah, in this case, so then we could define the magnification in the same way as image over image over object height, but in this case, there's going to be a negative sign because the thing is flipped. We would say that this is a real image, not a virtual image, because again, notice that there are actual photons, actual rays of light, uh, em you know, emerging or converging to that point. There's actual light there. As, a, as compared to say the mirror where let's see, where's the example? where a mirror where there's no actual light it appears like the light is coming from those points there's no actual light there all right so that's an example of how you can do one of these ray diagrams so again by the idea that the image is real that means that if you were to put a CCD or a Polaroid film or something there, you, or even just a piece of white paper, you would actually see an image. That's what you're going to do in lab. You're going to have essentially you know, long tracks that you can adjust the location of the lens and the location of essentially a white plastic plate. And you can adjust them and you can actually, you'll actually see an image form on the white plate um, when, things, when you have them all set up correctly. Because at, at that point, uh, everything kind of converges together, everything is in focus. And you see an image. These three rules, so I have a rule for the blue ray, and again, go in, 
horizontal, go through the focal point. The green, go through the focal point, come out horizontal. And then for the red, go through the center, unchanged. No retraction. How your image looks when it's in focus and all that, you know, whether it's flipped, whether it's bigger, whether it's smaller, all this really depends on where the object is located to the focal points of the lenses. So what if I have, for example, this down here, where now I have the object interior to the back focal point, where up here, where right, the focal points are here, the objects where the object is located outside the focal point. What do I get in this case? Well, you have to be a little bit careful because the three rules exactly as I wrote them above can't really be done, but we can again use some extrapolation. So the nice thing about rule three um, is that it's unchanged. So that if I go through, really they're all not really changed, but so that if I go through the center, I come out unchanged. So I can do something like that. Um, yeah. But I could also, you know, I guess what the text is trying to say is I can also kind of backward extend it as well. So if I wanted to also go backwards, I could do that too. And I'll do that as a dash line. It'll be obvious why I have to do that in a second. So then in the case of the other rules, um, they are really unchanged, they're more or less unchanged as well. But um, you might not go through, uh, well, let me do, let me do the blue one. All right, the blue one said I go from the top of the object in a, hor in a straight line, a horizontal line through the object. So if I do this and go, oops, not dashed. Solid. So if I go in a horizontal line and then emerge and go through the focal point. And then for the green one, I said I go through the focal point first and then I come out a straight line. Well, notice here I can't really, I can't draw a line that goes through the focal point first and then goes through, that goes from the object to the back focal point to the lens. So what we do instead, and again we can extrapolate all of these backwards. So for the blue one, I'm going to make a dashed line that and it goes in a straight line back this way. Um, uh, nope, sorry, sorry. Ignore that, please. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, let me just finish my example. I'm trying to do too many things in my head at once. So if I have a dashed line that went through the top of the object and the focal point, something like that, Right then, I could tell where it would hit the lens and then emerge out as a solid line. Then I can kind of just fill in and then draw my lens big enough. That's okay. So I can take the point and go in a solid line through the lens and then it comes out a solid line. Something like that. But then I want to erase this part. Because again, Real light rays, which I'm using solid lines to draw. Real light rays, I should erase this too. Real light rays, um, I'm going to draw solid lines. There's actual light there. So I use these rules more or less the same way. So for blue, again, horizontal line from the object to the lens, and then it goes out, hits the focal point. The red line, if it goes through the center point, it's unchanged. It's unchanged. And for the green, the green was the only way I had to do a little bit of, you know, is really what I could have said is any line that connects the top of the object and the back focal point, right? I can't, there is one line that connects the focal point and the top of the object. If I draw that, then it will emerge uh, as a horizontal line. And again, your eyeball is over here. Now, the issue that you might be noticing is that there is no location where all of these three rays of light come together. So what happens? Well, again, your brain then tries to fill in the blanks. Your brain is assuming all of these are coming in straight lines from you. So it will 
extrapolate all of these backwards. So it sees this horizontal green line, it will extrapolate uh, it will extrapolate it backwards in that direction. It sees this blue line coming at you in a straight line. It will extrapolate it backwards. Then it sees this red line coming at you in a straight line. Oh, and I actually did correctly. Oops. There we go. It will extrapolate it backwards. And then notice what happens, that there is a converging location for all of these three lines. And so what ends up going on is, oops, I brought over part of the line. And what ends up going on is you do see an image that looks something like this. So this is the image that ends up forming. But it is a virtual image. Notice it forms, the image forms on the same side as the object. And it, that no actual light is emerging from the location of that image. That point does not have any actual light. Uh, this is why I drew these as dash, right? Because these dash lines were your brain extra you know, taking this line and extrapolating it backwards. It was taking this line and extrapolating it backwards. This line and extrapolating it backwards. So in this case, it's magnified. It's um, not inverted, but it's a virtual image. If you put some, if you put a white piece of uh, plastic here, you would not see anything. But your brain sees it, right? You would see it and through the lens. But it'd be one of those things that would be some sort of Wonderland Narnia thing where it would feel like you have to reach into the lens in order to touch the object, or like a mirror. Which again is why we call it virtual versus real. All right. So sorry, I kind of uh, muddled through that example, but. Let me then do diverging lenses, uh, which I think I could just give you an example. You don't fill it in. Fill it in. A diverging lens has a, the opposite goal, or I will sometimes call it a concave lens, because they usually have concave shapes. And one example is the double diverging lens, which again, you can take two circles and kind of fill in the blank, uh, but they aren't overlapping. This kind of part right here is then a double convex lens, where it's fat on the top and the bottom and in the middle. It also has two focal points, um, but it has the effect of if, if parallel rays come in, then again, there's kind of two interfaces uh, each ray hits, and then just uses the law of refraction. And what it ends up doing is it diverges the rays from one another. Where these rays appear, if you were to extrapolate backwards, they would all appear to have emerged from a particular point which again we call the focal point. So that's the idea of a diverging lens. Um, so in both of these cases, notice that the path that these rays end up taking is because of the curvature that it hits uh, when it enters and leaves the lens. So the properties of these, you know, whether it's diverging and converging, um, these are properties that are based on the shape. Uh, nothing like composition, right? You can have two, a conversion and a diverging lens, both in a plastic, um, right? The, you know, to, in order to call it a converging lens, that means it's bringing light together. It depends on the shape of the object compared to uh, diverging. So then ray tracing ends up being very, very similar um, uh, with, you know, slightly altered rules. So again, I have the object, I have the focal points, and then I have my lens, which is in this case is a diverging lens. So the blue one, remember for concave, it was come in at a horizontal line, go towards the focal point. For diverging, it's come in at a horizontal line and diverge away as if it was coming from the back focal point. The symmetric green, come in as if it was going to go through the other focal point. So notice I didn't draw it through the back one, but I drew it through, by 
drew a straight line as if, if and if I kept going, it would have went through the front focal point. But instead, I just drew the part that went to the lens, and then it emerged out a horizontal line. And then rule three is unchanged. Right? It goes to the center, there's no refraction at all. And then you do the same sort of thing. So I have my object, this one comes in, diverges out. This one comes in, goes horizontal. This one comes in, nothing happens. These three, none of them actually, they don't converge on one another. So my brain fills in the blanks by projecting them backwards. And that's where the virtual image forms. Very, very tiny right there. Okay, so that's it. So, and again, We'll, work, we'll do some of these problems in class of just drawing these ray images for different objects and different lenses, you know, with the objects located kind of, this looks like I did one outside of the focal point, and you know, what if I put this inside the focal point, or you know, things like that we'll try in class. We really haven't been quantitative about this at all, it's just been doing through ray tracing, so we can now try to be a little bit, a little bit quantitative. So there is a lens equation. Where, so just to define, redefine everything again, again, I have my symmetric axis, my central axis, for a particular lens that has focal points, so we can define these focal distances. The distance from the lens to the object, and the distance from the lens to the image. And it all comes together in this relatively simple equation of 1 over f equals 1 over p plus 1 over r. But the only thing you have to be, and the magnification ends up just being negative i divided by negative p. So, this all works, and it doesn't matter whether it's converging or diverging, as long as you use the right sign conventions. So here are the sign conventions. The value for f, which is usually given to you, right? You have a particular lens that will say has a focal point of you know, 6 centimeters, something like that. You plug in plus 6 centimeters if it's a converging lens, or you, pl you plug in negative 6 centimeters if it's a diverging lens. So the value of f can be positive or negative, depending on the lens. The value of p, the convention is we always take that to be a positive number. Again, so what you plug in here is always a positive number. Because you might say, well, if this is the axis, this looks like it's negative. Well, careful, right? I never really put down an origin system. Uh, these are just conventions that work with this particular formula. And then the value of the image distance i, uh, we plug in a, a positive value if it's on the opposite side of the lens, i.e. a real image. So the way I've drawn, what I've drawn up here, um, I would plug in whatever this value is, if I measured it with a ruler or something, I would plug in a positive value to this equation. If it happened to be a virtual image, uh, it would appear on the same side, so if the arrow was over here instead, then this image distance, I would plug in a negative value for P, or for I, yes, say. negative if I on same lens side as P. And then, to understand the value of m, which I can then just take this ratio, with this negative sign is intentional, right, remember, i can be positive or negative, where p is always positive, so that means this entire thing could be negative or positive. Again, if you, ultimately when you plug numbers in, if m is less than zero, that just means the object is inverted. So I specifically chose arrows like this, because here, it's inverted, I should get a negative magnification. Again, negative, don't think of negative to mean down. Uh, negative just means it's flipped relative to the object. So since the object was pointing down, this one is inverted, it's pointing up. If its absolute magnitude is less than 1, that just means it shrinks. If its absolute magnitude is greater than 1, that means it's enlarged. So for this example above again, the focal point, the focal value would be a positive number, since it's a converging lens. P is always a positive number, and I would end up being a positive number. Usually I might be, is usually what you're solving for. Uh, so if I know F and P, I can solve for I, right? And I, if it's a positive number, uh, means that it's a real image on the other side. If it's negative, it will be on the same side as the uh, object. The magnification, I would then expect to be negative, because I would plug in negative, a positive number, divided by a positive number. So ultimately the entire thing is negative. It just means it will be inverted relative to the object. And uh, in this case, for this particular example, the way I draw it, it turns out that it's probably, that would shrink a little bit. 
but again, whether how it shrinks or whether it shrinks and that you know it depends on kind of where you place the object relative to the lens and its focal points. All right, so again, optical instruments like a microscope versus a telescope versus you know binoculars, they are using some usually combinations of lenses to achieve some sort of some sort of gain. A microscope, of course, its primary goal is to magnify things. A telescope, it's it's not the primary goal to magnify things, but to collect as much light as possible. Magnification kind of is an, uh, a secondary thing, because uh, usually we don't care, right? A point of light still looks like a point of light when you magnify it, because things are really far away. But So there are different goals in which you can, you know, by some adjustment of lenses, um, achieve. So that'll be, the, that'll be the last example I give. What if you do have multiple lenses? In this case, I have two converging lenses, and I have some object. How could I calculate what I ultimately see at the end of the day through multiple lenses? Well, the good news is that you just take them in stages. You treat the problem as if none of this is here, solve for where the image ultimately appears through that particular lens, and then that image becomes the object for the other lens. So then you pretend like all this is gone, and you start where you left off. So then that image then is where you then calculate the new image, and that's your final answer. Then it turns out, in this case, the overall magnification uh, ends up just being the product of each of the individual magnifications. So there was some magnification to go from that, then some magnification to go to that. Um, then you just take both of those values of m and multiply them together. So I'll end kind of doing this example. Now let's see, sorry, I don't need that yet. Let me actually move this down to. So here, here's the example. I have an object which I'm going to locate as this red arrow here, and I tried to draw everything here to scale since I give some actual numbers. There are two converging lenses. The object is located a distance of six centimeters from the first lens, um, which itself has a focal point of 24 centimeters. So notice that this lens here has two focal points, and each of these distances is 24 centimeters. Lens two is located 10 centimeters from the first lens, that's the value of L, and it has a focal point of nine, uh, nine centimeters. So then this distance here and this distance here, which I call F2, is nine centimeters. Where is the final image of the object? Again, if your eyeball is over here. All right, so again, we do this in stages. So that's where I have to hide this momentarily. So, the first stage is treat, let's take the black lens as lens one, and then the green as lens two. Ultimately, to get to your eye, it has to go through both. Uh, and the nice thing is, is that you get the same, you get the right answer as if, as if you just pretend like there was only one lens at a time. So, we could start first with ray tracing, and then actually do some calculations. So, ray tracing. Again, the rules uh, is that I could draw a line that goes directly through the center of the lens and it's unchanged. I could draw a line that's horizontal and then once it gets to the center of the lens, then converges towards the focal point. So I can do something like that. And I can do a third one as well if I wanted to. Now the thing you might notice is that on the other side of the lens, these, these rays are clearly not getting closer to one another. They seem to be diverging. So I anticipate a virtual image, so I'm going to then let my brain extrapolate backwards. And notice that when I do that, they do converge eventually. So I would draw my image. I draw my image, uh, thicker please. I draw my image where they converge here. So it looks like I get a virtual image. Located at that location. And if I did this carefully, I could actually use I could actually use a ruler or whatnot to calculate these distances and these heights. Um, but we also have the lens equation that lets us. Uh, calculate this for us. 
So again, the idea of 1 over f equals 1 over p plus 1 over i. And we'll use subscripts because we're dealing with lens 1, which has a focal length of 24 centimeters. The original object was um, 6 centimeters away from the lens. And then this image is located at some to be determined location. And again, we know f, we know p, we do not know i. And we just have to be careful about our sign conventions. So in this case, uh, f1 is plus 24 centimeters, because the convention is it's plus for a converging lens. p1 is plus, um, we said it was 6 centimeters away. Then you chug those through the equation, you should get at the end of the day that i1 equals negative 8 centimeters. So I draw it 8 centimeters behind the lens. Uh, and again, we can see it's a virtual image. The magnification, which is negative i1 over p1, looks then it's, it's negative, negative 8, divided by, and then p1 was what, 6? Uh, which we always take to be a positive number, so it looks like then this is plus 4 thirds. And it's 33% bigger. Okay? Of course, we're not done. That's the first lens. We can then do the same thing, but I have to. Uh, let's see. I should have really just copied. So copy this. So we have something to match to. I'm trying to draw this as much to scale as I can. Right, so I drew the red, the red arrow for comparison, right? That's where the original object was. So we don't need that for this drawing. So I'll get rid of that too. It's not confusing. So then I, I just treat this problem as its own problem, where I have some object, which is now this black arrow, and it's going through this green lens. And I'll use uh, black this time. So again, I can draw a horizontal line that goes to the lens and it converges through the green focal point. Yeah, I've gotten rid of the focal points for the lens that's no longer there. Then I could draw a line that goes to the, to the center and there's nothing changed. Then I could draw the third one, but who cares because I already can see where they're going to converge. So then it looks like the image is ultimately here. So we get a real image that looks flipped. And again, we can then be more quantitative about it. Maybe I should label some things, right? So we have this, right? That was F2. This then becomes the um, objects. You know, before we calculated that to be the image location. But then we take that image location now here, we make it the object's location. And then it looks like this ends up being the image. Okay. So, again, we have 1 over f2 equals 1 over p2 plus 1 over i2. The focal length is going to be positive. Um, let's see, what did we say it was? 9 centimeters. P2, uh, we always take to be a positive number, so it was negative 8 centimeters before. Um, but now we have to be careful. Um, because this distance is the distance from the object to the lens. Now that negative 8 before is here, negative 8 centimeters here, was the distance from the image to the black lens. And now we're taking that and making that same arrow, but now that's not this distance here is not eight centimeters. It was eight centimeters to get to the black lens, and then we also know that it was ten centimeters in between the two lenses. So in this case, P2 is convention, it's always a positive number, but then it's 18 centimeters. Right? So it's this 
what I call L plus the absolute magnitude of I1. That is the distance between the lenses and then the location of the previous image, which we then take to be the object for the second lens. And then plug and jug, we get that I2 in this case ends up being um, ends up turns out to be plus 18 centimeters as well. So, and then the magnification, negative plus 18 centimeters divided by, and then uh, P2 was plus 18 centimeters. So I think M is just negative one, which seems like I do this decently well enough. All right, it kind of goes up a little bit here. If there's, dot, if there's a dotted line here, I don't know if it's apparent on the screen. It goes a little bit past the dotted line, and then here it looks like it goes a little bit past the dotted line. So then, overall, then it depends on what you want to want you, what you want to return back. So overall, I would say the object appears 18 centimeters in front of the second lens, uh, or it would be 28 centimeters in front of the back lens. The overall magnification ends up, again, it's just the product of the two individual magnifications we just did. So it's 4 thirds multiplied by negative 1. So ultimately, the overall magnification is negative 4 thirds. So. Kind of nice. If you can do it for one lens, you can do it for as many lenses as you want. Um, no, maybe we'll look at one or two in class. It gives you um, a couple lenses to think about. So again, it's really all comes down to these ray tracing rules. So understanding these ray tracing rules of what you do with converging versus diverging. And then um, knowing that if you're seeing the ray, the actual rays not converge on the other side of the lens, your brain has to extrapolate backwards. And again, where I kind of muddied up this one is follow the rules, um, you know, in terms of drawing a line through the focal point, you know, for this green one, for example, you know, it's there, I can draw a line through the focal point and the object and then it emerges horizontal. Um, but again, only have the photons or the light rays uh, are solid if they come from the object. And if you're extrapolating backwards, I made them dash just to remind myself that there's no actual light there. All right.